Good to know. All right. Well, thank you again all for, for coming. And um, we have today with us Ted Yankowski, who is um, at the Butterfly House. He's the entomologist over at the Butterfly House. And we're excited to hear from him all about native butterflies today. So Ted, go ahead and take it away. All right. I'm going to share my screen here. And I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody while you're talking. Um, so Tad, you'll probably have to unmute yourself after I mute everybody. Okay, and then Tad, if you want to unmute and we can go ahead. All right, can everybody see my screen? I guess that's the first, now that I wait until you're muted. Can everybody <laughs> see the PowerPoint? Yeah. All right. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tad Yankoski. I am uh, the senior entomologist out here at the Butterfly House. Uh, let's see, there we go. Uh, so today we're gonna talk about uh, the uh, 25 of Missouri's most common butterflies and how to identify them. I have a pop-up from Zoom on my screen that I doubt you guys can see that I'm trying to get rid of that popped up. Uh, it is showing up on ours. All right. Well, let me see what I can do about this. I've never seen that before. All right. I think it's better now. Uh, so uh, for the top 25 most common Missouri butterflies, um, these are butterflies that you can find and expect to encounter in multiple different habitats. Um, these are not always the most easiest butterflies to identify, but these are the most commonly encountered ones. Some habitats will have species in abundance that are not on this list. If you're in a wooded area, you're gonna see more things like tree nymphs and other things like that, that you rarely see outside of those habitats. And so they don't really make the list, but if you're only looking at forest butterflies, the list would be um, a little different than this. So, and there's a long list, so I'll go through them pretty quick. If at any point anybody has any questions, feel free to type them in chat. And then if anybody sees uh, that there's been questions asked, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, and then I also will have questions uh, at the end if we have time as well. Um, so the first butterfly we'll talk about is one I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, it's the monarch butterfly. It's, uh, you know, one of the most uh, recognizable butterflies I think that we have in Missouri. It's large and orange and black. Uh, it has the white spots around the edge. Um, it's fairly big. It's one of the largest ones that we have. Um, hopefully it doesn't need too much further explanation because it's a pretty well-known butterfly. However, we do have the Viceroy as well, which is one that mimics the monarch and is often confused for the monarch, um, which is sort of uh, you know, done on purpose by the butterfly. Um, it feeds on willow trees. So if you happen to be in an area with lots of willows or on wetlands, you tend to see these a little bit more frequently, um, but they will stray and you'll see them in prairies and uh, you know, sometimes uh, backyard gardens and things like that as well. Now, uh, telling them apart can be a little tricky when you're first learning how to identify butterflies and how to get sort of a feel for them, but uh, it's not too hard once, once you get uh, your mind's eye set of what to look for. The big thing with the Viceroy is that they have this black band that sort of cuts their hind wing in half and it divides it right in half right here. And if you look over here, the monarch butterfly does not have that vein, vein uh, that divides um, its rear wing. Now, the Viceroy is a little bit smaller than the Monarch on average. Now, if you don't have them side by side, it can be a little tricky to use uh, size as a comparison. But once you sort of get a feel for them, you'll realize that Viceroy's are about half the size of a full uh, size Monarch butterfly. 
Uh, about the Viceroy and Monarch, uh, my teachers lied to me growing up and I wouldn't be surprised if they lied to many of you because I was taught for years and years that the Viceroy stole the bad reputation of the Monarch and that the Viceroys were tasty for things like birds and Monarchs are uh, toxic. Uh, they store alkaloids from the milkweeds uh, from when they're a caterpillar and as a result, they're, they're not um, palatable to birds and other uh, animals. And that's true for the Monarch. Uh, the monarchs are poisonous if eaten. Uh, you can ingest enough of them that you could even get sick or die uh, if depending on what animal you are. But they always were taught me that the viceroy was palatable, that birds could eat them, but they stole the bad reputation. And it turns out they're doing more experiments and they've actually found that the viceroy has its own toxins and it also doesn't taste bad. And so it's a different type of mimicry where they both reinforce that the other one tastes bad. It's not one doing all the heavy lifting and the other one stealing uh, the reputation. So they both taste bad. And that's sort of where um, entomologists have uh, transitioned over the last few years. Uh, next is the cabbage white. Depending on where you are, this is often one of the most common butterflies in your area. It may or may not be the most common butterfly in the world. It's found uh, on basically every continent but Antarctica. It's become pretty well established. Uh, it feeds on things in the cabbage family. Uh, and as a result, um, they sort of explode in number around people. Um, you will see these uh, in ditches and stuff along highways really commonly. Um, it's one of the first butterflies I see every year. We saw a few um, back in, I guess it was late April was when we were seeing them here at the Butterfly House. Um, they are medium sized or slightly smaller than medium sized uh, butterflies. Um, and they have black wingtips. And they vary from being almost like, a, you know, ghost white to having a little bit of yellowish color to them, but they're more white than they are yellow. Um, and they have the dark tip of the wings and then they have spots on their wings right here. You see this one has two spots. Um, I believe it's two spots is a female, one spot is a male. Uh, two spots uh, in two syllables, female, two syllables, two spots, male, one syllable, one spot. That's how I always remember it. I believe that's right. Uh, the most uh, commonly uh, encountered one that people get confused with it by are the uh, sulfur butterflies that we have there. The cabbage white is a type of sulfur and uh, we have a few um, native sulfurs. The cabbage white's technically from um, Europe originally. Um, when you have the native uh, sulfurs, you'll see that they tend to have a little bit more color on their wings. Uh, the most common uh, sulfurs that you see around here are the orange or common sulfurs. They're actually two different species, but they're so hard to tell apart when they're flying that we sort of group them as one. Um, you'll see uh, the most notable trait is this right here, the silver little eight or the silver snowman. Um, excuse me. Um, that is very um, reminiscent uh, for these guys. Um, you can see it sometimes when they're flying, but as soon as they land, that is very noticeable. Um, the uh, cabbage white has nothing like that on the underside of its wings. Um, these guys have that very noticeable um, eight or donut or snowman or whatever you want to call it. When their wings are open, they often have uh, a black pattern that extends all the way down their wings where the cabbage white, it's only at the tip. Ted, um, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, what, what, how big would you call a medium sized? That's a great question. So we have butterflies that range in size from about the size of a nickel is about our smallest. And that's gonna be some of our um, Eastern tail blue and related species we'll see in just a minute up towards the monarch or a um, great spangled fritillary are some of our largest butterflies. Um, for these, you're looking at a medium sized one is probably in the neighborhood of a two inch wingspan. Small is probably one inch wingspan or smaller. And then the largest can have up to four inch wingspans. Um, 
so basically, like I said, this silver spot is very um, useful for, for identifying the common or the orange sulfur. There's a lot of variability in their wings. They can have a lot of orange, they can have a lot of white, they can have some yellow, they can have sort of this pink fringe. These guys are tricky to tell apart uh, and they're tricky to know exactly what you're looking for because there's so much variability um, in, in what color and patterns and the amount of color and stuff that can be on their wings. Um, but they're also about the only common sulfur butterfly you'll see that has this sort of pattern on their wings. So if you see um, that black uh, heavy border, you know it's probably the orange or common sulfur. Um, they're very common in pastures and alfalfa fields and things like that. We also have the cloudless sulfur here in Missouri. This is our largest sulfur butterfly. It's about twice the size of a cabbage white. It's the only butterfly we get this large and this Tweety Bird yellow. It's very distinctive, that color. There's nothing else like it that has that size and that color of butterfly. Um, this is one that does not survive the winter here. Uh, it dies out every year and then the populations in the south slowly expand north with each generation in the spring. And so these tend to show up anywhere from mid summer into the fall. Um, sometimes depending on how mild the winter was down south, they show up a little earlier. We've had a few show up really early the last few years, but generally speaking, you see these a little bit later in the year because they have to repopulate from the south. Uh, but they're the only butterfly that has this really tweedy bird yellow color. It can be basically solid yellow on top, and sometimes they have a little bit of border and a little bit of spots. Uh, but they're the only butterfly that has that color yellow, and you don't even have to get close to it because you can see it from a distance, and it's the bright yellow butterfly that's your cloudless sulfur. There are a few other sulfurs that are out there that we won't cover, like the little yellow, which has sort of this color yellow, but is a fraction of the size. And there's some other ones that come out very early in the season. Um, but generally speaking, these are by far the most commonly encountered sulfurs. Our number one most frequently counted butterfly for the Missouri Butterfly Monitoring Network, which I'm the director of. We have people go out to sites all around St. Louis and all around Missouri and sample and monitor the butterflies that are there. This has been about 50% of the time, this is our number one most seen butterfly for the year. And that's the Eastern tailed blue. This is a tiny butterfly. This is the one that its wings are open. It's, you know, maybe the size of a nickel or a quarter, or maybe about an inch uh, across. Beautiful blue butterfly. Um, it is the only blue butterfly that we get that has these little orange spots on its wings. It has the tails as well, which gives it the name tailed blue, but the tails break off very easily. And so sometimes you'll find these guys in the wild and they won't have tails, uh, but the more um, diagnostic feature is these orange spots. And when the wings are open, you can see them on top. And when the wings are closed, you can see an orange mark on the bottom as well. The other related species that we have here do not have that orange um, band or orange spot. Sometimes the females can be uh, a gray color. They're not that sky blue that we saw with the males. Um, but uh, there's a lot of variability in the color uh, and patterns that happen throughout the year. Um, there's some, some of these species will have sort of a summer morph and a winter morph, and the colors will change a little bit. But the orange spot and presence of the tail when it's there is always indicative of the eastern tail blue. You see these guys a lot on the edges of forested areas where they come to a field or a pasture or even where um, like a ditch area along the side of the road where it meets the woods. You tend to see these guys right at the edge of where the trees and, and uh, uh, the tall grasses start. Um, where you see one, there's often dozens or hundreds. They can be very abundant. The only butterfly that you're likely to really confuse it with in large numbers is the spring or summer azure. We, depending on who you ask, the spring and summer azure is either one species, two species, or I believe the last count was they were trying to divide it up into 34 different species. If there's any taxonomists out there, I shake my fist at you. Um, I say that sitting next to a taxonomist. Um, 
these guys, uh, we sort of group them together. Um, they're looking at genetic markers and locations and things like that, trying to break them apart into um, different species. But for the most part, um, we can assume that all of these spring summer azures are the same species because they uh, inhabit the same area and have very similar, if not identical life histories. Uh, like the uh, Eastern tailed blue, they are sort of white salt and peppered on the underside, bright blue on the inside, but you'll notice they do not have a tail and they do not have the orange spot visible from either side. And you tend to see these in forested areas on the edge of forests. Sometimes they'll visit other areas. I find them in the, on the clover in my front yard and things like that. But the places I see the most is when I walk down a trail in the woods and I kind of see them in the area of the trail where there's still a lot of sun coming in before the forest sort of envelops the trail. That's where I see these guys the most in the wild. Beautiful blue when they uh, open their wings. When these guys land, they close their wings. It's almost impossible to get a shot with them with their wings open. Sometimes you'll see them sort of rubbing their wings together, um, but uh, it's very hard to get a picture like this. Um, this Even this one is, is harder. Um, and uh, sometimes they can have uh, a border and things like that. Uh, but the thing I look at most is just, I look for the orange spot and that'll tell you right away if it's an Azure or if it's one of the Eastern tail blues. Uh, I saw a second that we had a uh, chat. Was there any questions that popped up? Um, the question was, um, what do most butterflies use for their food source? So as adult butterflies, most of the butterflies we're gonna talk about here um, utilize nectar. There are a few butterflies that um, will go for tree saps and things like that, especially in the spring. If a butterfly is very early to come out in the spring, it's gonna go for um, fruits or tree saps and things like that before there's a lot of flowers out. But the vast majority of these um, butterflies we're gonna talk about are just nectar feeders that you'll see in a variety of different native wildflowers. Um, there's a few other ones that have more unique histories, like they some that specialize on um, like insect honeydew and things like that. But for the most part, these guys are all um, nectar feeders. And for caterpillars, they have wide varieties of host plants, by the way. Um, like this is the zebra swallowtail. Its caterpillar host plant is the pawpaw tree. Uh, it only eats the leaves of pawpaw tree. And as a result, it doesn't stray terribly far away from pawpaw. And so if you're in a forested area where there's no pawpaw, it's less likely you'll see these. Uh, but if you're in a flower garden or a prairie or in the woods that are close to an area with lots of pawpaw trees, it's much more likely you'll see these beautiful black and white butterflies. They look sort of like a fighter jet, very streak and aer uh, sleek and aerodynamic. Um, they're the only butterfly that looks anything like this that we have around here. It's very easy to tell them apart from, from anything else. Uh, the beautiful butterfly. Another swallowtail that we get is the zebra, uh, sorry, is the giant swallowtail. These are probably the largest butterfly you'll see in Missouri outside of the butterfly house. Um, this is another species that cannot survive the winter here. Um, they die off every year and they naturally move north along with their host plant as their host plant sort of um, uh, gets leaves and, and, and flourishes in the spring, they slowly move north. Uh, these eat anything in the um, citrus family. So around here we have some hop trees and things like that that you'll find the caterpillars on. Um, very distinctive yellow band that goes from wingtip to wingtip. Um, there's pretty much nothing else in Missouri that looks like this. Uh, some people say it looks like a smiley face. You know, it's like a, a mouth is open there. Um, but it's the only thing that you'll see the solid yellow band from wingtip to wingtip. And these guys often sit in exactly this pose. I'll see them hanging on trees, um, maybe eight, 10 feet off the ground oftentimes, and they look exactly like they do in this photo. Now we're gonna get into some of the, this is a black swallowtail, and we're also gonna talk about the group of black swallowtails uh, plural multiple species that are black and that are swallowtails and they all look similar. 
and most of them are toxic if eaten. And so they sort of reinforce that don't eat me because I taste bad. Uh, and as a result, they've evolved to look very similar. So they can be kind of tricky to tell apart. Um, but there's a few little things that once you learn, they're actually not that hard for the most part. Uh, the first we'll talk about is the black swallowtail. The first black swallowtail we'll talk about is the black swallowtail. This is one of the more common butterflies in Missouri. If you've ever grown parsley or dill or fennel, you've probably encountered one of their caterpillars because sometimes uh, people call the caterpillars parsley worms. They're black and green and white stripes. Some people confuse them for monarch butterfly caterpillars. Um, about once a summer, we'll get someone calling and asking why milkweed, or sorry, why monarch butterflies are eating um, their parsley, and we have to tell them that they're these guys. Um, as adults, the most important thing for them is that they have, uh, I think I have another slide, uh, they have two sets of yellow spots right here. And there's two lines of the spots on their upper and lower wings. This is a male at the top. This is a female at the bottom. A lot of these, uh, this group of black swallowtails, the females will have blue coloration on their lower wings. You can see it right here. But the black swallowtail, they have two sets of those spots. Even though the female, it's not as distinctive as for the male, and you can clearly see two rows of spots. And also down here, you've got this orange spot with an iris. It's got the, the eye in it. Um, that's one of the ways to tell these apart. Looking at it with its wings closed, you can still see the two rows of spots. And it has the unbroken orange band here. That may not seem like a lot, but that's very diagnostic to tell us apart from another butterfly we'll meet in just a minute. And you can also see with the wing closed, that you've got this orange circle with the eye spot in the middle. So with the wings closed, you've got the unbroken orange band in the eye spot here. This is the spice bush swallowtail, a very similar one in uh, parts of Missouri. This is incredibly common. The further west you go, you see it a little bit less frequently. You'll notice with the wings closed, that orange band is broken by the blue swoosh. This blue always breaks the line in half for the spice bush swallowtails. And that makes it very easy to tell, sometimes from really far away, once you get to, to trained what you look for, I can probably tell these guys apart from 30 feet away. Um, it's very noticeable. Also, looking at the top, they don't have the two rows of yellow spots, and they don't have that little eye spot pupil in that orange spot there. But to me, the no-brainer thing is I look at that orange swoosh, done. I don't need to look any further. I know that's a spice bush swallowtail. With its wings open, you'll see it only has one row of spots. You could argue that there's sort of a second ghost one there, which is probably true, but you don't really see that very well out in the field. Uh, you, it's the, the one row of very prominent spots that are here. Whereas the black swallowtail spots tend to be a little bit more yellow, the spice bush are white that sort of transition into, into either blue or green color. Um, the spice bush has a lot more personality in those spots. They get some color to them. Um, you'll notice that both of these, they have blue towards the bottom of their wings on the female. And that'll play uh, a little bit more of a role in identifying them uh, for some other species in just a minute. This is the pipe vine swallowtail. Um, this is one butterfly that is not nearly as photogenic as it is in real life. Uh, they're beautiful butterflies, very metallic blue color to them on their, under, uh, on their lower wings, especially. Um, right here, this is just absolutely stunningly metallic blue. We actually get a few phone calls a year from people that think that um, our blue morpho butterflies here at the Butterfly House escaped and they see them in their yard and they call us. And I always say, oh no, you have a morpho in your yard? Yeah. Does it have the orange spots on the other side of its wings? They go, sure does. And I go, that's a pipe vine swallowtail. Morphos don't have orange spots. Um, it's the only butterfly you're going to see that just looks like it's, um, you know, 
like uh, plated in metal that just makes it like just dance in the sunlight. It's very beautiful. Um, with its wings closed, it does have this circle of orange. But you'll see that they sort of look like orange islands. It's not a continuous orange band. You know, if you go back here to the black swallowtail, it's much tighter grouped together. And when we go back here, you can see that there's a clear blue border around them. Uh, but really for these, you just look at them when their wings are open and it's very um, metallic looking. They're easy to tell apart for that reason. All right, this is one that's probably responsible for some of the most confusion. The tiger swallowtail, when you see um, this coloration of it, is very unique to Missouri and easy to tell apart. Um, mostly yellow with these big black bands that go across it, kind of tiger striped, how it got its name. Uh, one of the larger butterflies, at times it's one of the most common butterflies that we see during the summer. Um, beautiful butterfly. It'll fly up high. It'll come down to plants like this bee balm here, as, uh, but you'll see it up in the trees a lot. Unfortunately, when we're trying to identify them, the females can be kind of tricky. This is the female of the same species. The female can either look oops, like the male or it can be almost entirely black without the tiger stripes. For these, for the dark morph females, you have the blue that starts at the very bottom and basically goes up and touches the body. That's one of the easiest ways of telling these apart. If we hop back real quick and look at like the spice bush swallowtail, you'll see that the blue stops pretty far down the wings, where these, it travels all the way up, almost touching the body. When the light hits these, the tiger stripe pattern is actually still there. It's black on black, and so it's a little tricky to see, but oftentimes when you're outside with actual sunlight, you can see those black patterns are still there and they look almost like shadows built into the wings. Once you train yourself to look for those patterns, you'll see them really frequently as well. And no other swallowtail butterfly have, have, around here have any sort of stripes like these guys do. Um, but I've had multiple people over the years, every year, um, on butterfly identification websites and things like that, um, try to convince me that this was a different species than, than the other, you know, the, the, the male, because people are surprised at how drastic the male and female are, are uh, colored uh, differently. So this is one that is the biggest pretender in the group. Uh, all the other ones we've talked about that are sort of blue and black uh, are swallowtail butterflies. This is a brush-footed butterfly. It's in the same family now as things like the Viceroy. They're actually very closely related to the Viceroy. Um, mimicry is big in this genus. Um, they mimic other things. This is mimicking the spice. Uh, it's actually mimicking the pipevine swallowtail. Um, and then the Viceroy mimics the monarch. Uh, so it's called the red spotted purple. Uh, it always bugs me that it's neither red spotted nor purple, um, but that's its name. Um, it's pretending to be these larger black butterflies side by side. This is much smaller. Um, it is a canopy dweller as well. I see these much more frequently about 10 feet off the ground than I do down on flowers. They obviously do come down to feed, but they spend more of their resting time sort of hanging on lower branches of tall trees and things like that is where I see them the most. Um, they're not a swallowtail where the other ones will have the tails. These guys don't have the tails. They have the orange stripe, uh, orange spots, and then, then sort of this this row. Um, but it's once you sort of train yourself, you'll see that it's very different from the others. Uh, it's a smaller butterfly. It doesn't have the tails, and it's just pretending. Um, you'll notice that the swallowtails here have these long tails. These tails will sometimes break off, but oftentimes you'll see them. At least one of the wings will still have them. Was there a question, Susan? Yeah, it was actually, is there a purpose for the tails on the hind wings of the swallowtails? So possibly, um, you know, it's evolution is one of those funny things like 
it serves a purpose. Is that why it evolved? Who knows? Um, birds are one of the biggest predators for butterflies and they'll try to catch them in midair. Um, and that probably gives the birds a target to lock onto and the bird will grab it with its beak and they break off really easily. Um, oftentimes you can basically look at the butterfly funny and its tails break off. We joke about that here at the butterfly house a lot. And if it's a bird, it grabs that, well, it falls off in the bird's mouth, the butterfly gets away and the bird just has a little piece of wing. Um, that's, that's the most likely use of that for the butterfly. Um, so going back to these real quick, they can be a little tricky, a little intimidating when I'm teaching my butterfly monitors how to identify butterflies. This is one of the most, hmm, a group that gives the most frustration. But honestly, once you sort of know what to look for with these different traits, they're very distinctive. They just kind of can be intimidating. But don't let them intimidate you. Learn things like the swoosh or the lack of the swoosh, and you're gonna find that these guys are pretty easy to tell apart. One of our most friendly butterflies, if you've ever worked in an area with lots of hackberry trees, you've probably encountered the hackberry emperor. Um, it's uh, sort of a grayish white butterfly with its wings closed, with its wings open. Um, it's very brown. These guys love, especially the males, like people's sweat and they are very aggressive at times getting your sweat. I've been out on hikes doing butterfly monitoring walks and there's a lot of hackberries here in Faust Park where the butterfly house is. And I've had these guys just swarm me to the point that it's like distracting and kind of annoying where I'm like, get off me. And they fly around and they do two laps around you and they land on the same spot because they want your sweat that's on the back of your neck or your shirt or whatever. Um, they're beautiful butterflies. Uh, like I said, if you're not around hackberry, they're less common, but when there's hackberry trees nearby, these guys can be pretty abundant. Um, they have a close relative uh, that is the tawny emperor, which is less common. Chances are, if you see a butterfly that looks like this, it's gonna be the hackberry. If you're like, oh, I remember it being more brown and this is more orange, that might be the tawny emperor, but you see about 25 times more hackberries than you do tawny emperors. Um, and if there's one that's mobbing you for your sweat, it's probably one of the emperor butterflies. <coughs> Excuse me one second. So this is the question mark butterfly. Um, this is in the group of angle wing butterflies or punctuation mark butterflies. Uh, beautiful butterfly. Um, the coloration can sort of change and be dependent on the season, uh, but the overall wing shape is what to me helps identify these guys the most. Um, you'll notice that, that this and the following comma butterflies I'll show you have sort of scalloped angular wings. The tips of the question mark butterfly are very pointed, they're very sharp. They have this beautiful purple um, border, which is very vibrant. It kind of glows. Um, it's almost like day glow purple. And they have this sort of mottled orange and black coloration, but this can be pretty variable up here. Uh, what I look for is the border and the shape of these points. With its wings closed, you can see those points sticking out almost like someone sticking their finger and pointing their finger. The most diagnostic part is this spot right here, which gives it its name. Some people looked at these, this pair of spots and said, well, that's obviously a question mark. So we're gonna call it the question mark butterfly. It has two spots, sort of the C or the comma and the little dot. <clears throat> these guys are pretty skittish. They're tricky to get close to. And so when they're flying, oftentimes, I'm lucky if I can get within 15 feet of them, which is not close enough to see these spots. If you're somehow lucky and you can get right up close to them, you can easily tell them apart from those spots. But uh, you know, in the field, it's not the easiest thing. So what I look for is the, the finger point, the, the very sharp angle of the wings. 
uh, is, is pretty helpful to tell these apart from the commas, the Eastern comma. As you can see, the comma and the question mark have fairly similar wing patterns. They're very closely related. They're in the same genus. Uh, you'll see that the wing points don't go out with quite as sharp of, of a point for it as the question marks. Also, they lack or have a much less dramatic purple band around the underside of the wings. And if you get a nice close up of that little shape right there in their wings, you see it looks sort of like a comma, uh, but there's no dot in the middle to make it the question mark. So the question mark has sort of two spots, comma only has one, and it doesn't have the point that sticks out. Uh, there's also a gray comma, which is less frequently encountered. Uh, but again, the question mark, you've got two spots. The Eastern comma, which is the most commonly one uh, you'll see uh, commonly encountered, has a little bit of a fish hook end. And then the gray comma, which is the least co common one, it's just more of a banana shape with no fish hook tip. Uh, generally speaking, you're either going to see the question mark or the Eastern comma. Those are the two that you'll probably encounter. These are ones that you see a little bit more frequently in the woods. Um, you'll see them elsewhere too. They'll leave the woods and go to flowers and stuff. Uh, but when I walk my trail that goes through the woods, this, these are some of the more common butterflies I see. This is one of the butterflies that you will sometimes see feeding on things other than nectar in the spring. The morning cloak will feed on things like tree saps. You can also bait them early in the spring by putting out bananas uh, or other things like that. Um, the morning cloaks overwinter as adults. Um, I've had I have a lot of stories about people calling me. I get calls every day. Uh, we've had people call me December, January, February, and they'll say, I was cleaning my attic, I was cleaning my basement, and I found a butterfly that was trapped in my basement, so I put it outside. I, you put a butterfly outside in January? I sure did. Okay, probably shouldn't do that next time. Uh, morning cloaks will go into attics, crawl spaces, basements. Before there were houses, they would go under bark, under logs and caves, things like that to overwinter as adults, anything to survive the elements. Uh, and so they come out early in the spring as adult butterflies before most other butterflies are out because they overwintered as adults and they're hungry. Oftentimes there's not a lot of flowers then, so they're going to tree saps and things like that. You put bananas out, you might get some. Um, you tend to see them pretty early on and then I don't encounter them too often throughout the year and then you'll see them again in the fall. Uh, you don't see these guys a lot in the summer though. Um, but the closer you are to wooded areas, you'll see more of them. And they have this very distinctive band that goes around um, their wings, this, this thick whitish yellow band that's sort of unique to them. Uh, I saw some flashes. Do we have any more questions? We're just identifying the plant as a milkweed. Yes, yes, this one's on milkweed. Uh, beautiful. I'm not sure which one. I look, I guess it's Syriaca, but it's a little, a little different coloration flowers. It's probably just common milkweed. Uh, so they will go to flowers um, as well, but in the early spring, they're, they're looking for other things for food. Uh, depending on the year and locally, these populations can just explode. Here in Faust Park, uh, the Red Admiral butterfly of like three years ago was borderline plague proportions. There were thousands of them. It was almost goofy. You'd walk outside and it would just be clouds of these butterflies. Um, they feed on thistle. And so, it, you know, which is a pretty common weed and they can just take off. Um, they're the only butterfly that really looks like this with this sort of if, if you imagine it was connected, it's sort of a big orange circle that goes uh, around their body. The front half is sort of cut off. Um, and then a few little white spots on black on the tips. When their wings are closed, and I should add, these are relatively small butterflies, about the size of a cabbage white or a painted lady, if you're familiar with those. With the wings closed though, they are very well camouflaged and they will often land on bark 
and freeze and they just vanish when they're on bark. Um, you can walk right up to them. If you're not exactly sure where it landed when you watched it fly, you're never gonna see these guys. And they're gonna sit motionless because they know they blend in so well that uh, unless you're basically touching them, they're not gonna budge or fly away. Um, bark, some people think it's a little bit of like a bird poo mimic as well. Maybe when it's on the ground, it could blend in for that reason as well, uh, but very cryptically colored and they're very good at blending in. Uh, but when their wings are open, very noticeable, very easy to tell the, uh, the orange band. So another common one is the painted lady. Um, this is actually another one that a lot of people don't know that cannot survive Missouri's winters. They die off uh, and they repopulate from the south. We have both the painted lady and the American lady here. The American lady is much less common around the St. Louis area than the painted lady. Um, but basically you've got sort of this uh, tiger black and orange with a little bit of white spotting um, with, uh, with the white tips. Um, when the wings are closed, again, they're fairly camouflaged or kind of like a mosaic pattern, but for the painted ladies, they have this row of eye spots right here. Uh, which is uh, pretty distinctive to them and diagnostic. This is the American lady on the left and the painted lady on the right. With the American lady, it only has these two large eye spots and painted ladies either have four or five eye spots that are much smaller. Um, I was, I was always trained to remember the phrase, American ladies have big eyes. And if you can remember that, they have the big eye spots right here, as opposed to the smaller eye spots here. Um, with the wings open, the American lady looks more like a washed out version of the painted lady. Uh, the color spots and the distinctions are much more blended together. And with the uh, painted lady, they're much more distinctive. There's clear borders from where orange and black and white begin and stop. There's all these little things you can look for, like this white band here is diagnostic and things like that. But I'm more looking at the bigger picture where I'm just like, well, that one looks more blurry and this one looks more sharp. And that's sort of what I look for. Um, with their wings closed, however, these eye spots, you can tell from 30 feet away which ones they are. They're very distinctive. Um, I've only ever seen a handful of American ladies around St. Louis, uh, where I've seen painted ladies much more frequently. Buckeye butterfly, very cool butterfly, very similar to the painted lady in that it cannot survive the winter. All the ones have to repopulate from the south. Um, it's the only butterfly that with its wings open has these big multicolored eye spots. Um, some of the only things you could really confuse it for are some butterflies like tree nymphs and things like that that are mostly deep in the woods. You don't see them out at fields or at clover on lawns and things like that um, where you will see the buckeyes. Um, fun fact, the coloration you see here, the purple and orange and yellow on these eye spots, that's actually created by the amino acid tryptophan, which is the exact same thing that makes you sleepy if you eat too much turkey. And so in theory, if you eat enough buckeye butterflies, they would make you sleepy. Um, but yeah, the, these, these large eye spots are pretty much giveaways. You know, you've got these orange, uh, orangish red bands or chevrons or whatever you want to call them here. Uh, but really they're the only butterflies with these big eye spots when the wings are open. So I believe the last two years, the Pearl Crescent has been our number one most seen butterfly for our counts here in Missouri. Um, these are ones that can sort of explode in number as well. They like to exist in sort of disturbed prairie kind of habitats. They do really well in. Um, here in Faust Park, they're undergoing some prairie restoration. And these guys are all over on this grass that they've cut down to be like six, eight inches tall where they're trying to get rid of Johnson grass and other stuff. And you see pearl crescents all over the place. Um, they're tiny butterflies, maybe an inch, maybe an inch and a half at most uh, with their wings open. Um, this orange and black checker pattern. A couple things to note. There's a similar butterfly called the silvery checker spot. 
which has these spots right here that have big silver spots in the middle. It looks like an eye or a donut um, where these have solid black. Silvery checker spots are also a little bit bigger, but not a whole lot bigger. But they have these very noticeable silver spots once you're looking for them, you can tell them apart very easily. With a pearl crescent with its wings closed, the upper wing is a darker orange than the bottom. You see a very distinct coloration change between the lower wings and the upper wings. And that can be incredibly diagnostic. When you see that in the field, you know exactly what it is. That's a tiny orange and yellow butterfly with its wings closed. That's gonna be your pearl crescent. Uh, and it's probably uncommon to see one of these. You're either gonna see none or you're gonna see like 30 of them. They're, they're, pretty, they're pretty common when they're out there. Um, I think we had some other questions come in, but we're getting towards the end. So I'll just finish this and then we'll take all the questions we have left uh, uh, when we get there. Great spangled fritillary. It's a neat butterfly, really big. Um, I always associate this with seeing them. Uh, they, they're like they're like bold sitters on plants. I always feel like where other butterflies will maybe hang from the flower and nectar. They don't want to be seen. I always see the great spangled fritillary like right on the top. Like here I am. What are you going to do about it? I'm sitting on the top of the goldenrod. I'm sitting on the top of the uh, echinaceas and coneflowers and milkweed. They're always out, uh, probably because they're toxic. Uh, they know that nothing will mess with them, but I always see them right in the top of plants. They're a large butterfly, about the size of a monarch, if not a little bit bigger. Um, they have, again, which is fairly common amongst some of these butterflies, you've got this orange and black pattern uh, on their upper wings. When their wings are closed, though, they're incredibly distinctive because you see these rows of very silvery um, spots. They're very metallic. They stand out really well in sunlight. And that's probably one of the reasons why birds are so keen to avoid them is because it's so distinctive. They understand and learn pretty quickly that they would uh, make them sick if eaten. Um, you often see these in wildflower prairies and things like that, but I'm always surprised at how many I see when I'm walking through the woods. These guys are strong flyers. And you'll see them cruising through wooded areas just as much as you see them um, out on uh, wildflower prairies and things like that. The variegated fritillary is one you see a lot less common. It's the only other fritillary we have that is easily confused by the upper side of the wings. The variegated fritillary is much smaller and uh, it's more cryptic with its wings closed, whereas the other one has those big silver spots on the great spangled fritillary. Uh, I see, the only place I see these guys with any regularity is when I'm doing float trips. They like to hang out on the side of rivers for whatever reason. Um, I've never seen them very far away from, from water features and usually moving water. Whether or not that's a coincidence, I don't know for sure, but that's the only place I've seen them with any regularity here in Missouri. Last one we'll talk about specifically is the silver spotted skipper. Um, we'll talk about skippers as a whole in just a minute, but the silver spotted skipper is the easiest one to tell apart. It's a large skipper, which is still actually kind of a smallish butterfly, uh, but skippers in general are tiny and this is a large uh, skipper. Uh, it has this, what looks like white, it's white or sort of silvery, a little bit of reflective um, spot on the lower side of its wings. When these guys are feeding, they almost never stop moving. They're at least always kind of vibrating or shaking their wings just a little bit. And so that, um, that spot really catches the light. And they'll, it also when it's flying, it'll fly past you and it's very noticeable. Um, you'll, you'll see it and go, what was that? And it was something flashing and oftentimes that's a silver spotted skipper. They have, uh, it's brown with this orange band, uh, but really, I mean, this is diagnostic and that's what you're looking for. And you see that, you know, it's a silver spotted skipper. There are lots of skippers in Missouri. And it's worth mentioning that right now we're grouping them in with butterflies, depending on who you ask, again, shaking my fist at those taxonomists, they are butterflies or they're not. So right now, Lepidoptera, the overall group, has butterflies and moths in it, that's the order, or it has butterfly moths and skippers as their own group. Skippers do a lot of things that butterflies don't do. They have a cocoon where butterflies don't, only moths do. 
Um, they hold their wings differently. There's a little bit of different morphology in their wings. There's a few other things that are kind of weird for skippers that they don't really fit in with butterflies, um, at least morphologically. But for now, they are grouped with butterflies and for all intents and purposes are considered butterflies for this. A lot of skippers are um, strays from the south, um, just like things like the buckeye and the painted lady. Um, the, probably by the fall in many areas, the most common butterfly you'll see is the fiery skipper, which is orange with black spots. It looks like, uh, you know, embers coming out of a fire. But it's, an, it's, it's a species that sort of comes into Missouri, explodes in number by the end of the season, and then it's gone. And then you don't see it until late summer or, or early fall again. Um, looking at my master list for all butterfly species that are considered to be native or strays from other locations in Missouri. I think we have 189 total butterflies. If I recall, that was our final count when we made the list and updated it last year. Of those 189, I believe 87 of them are skippers. So there's 80 plus different species of skippers that you can find in Missouri. I can reliably tell about on a good day, 10 of them apart. Um, there are a lot that I've been out in the field with experts and I go, what's this? And they go, I don't know. <laughs> I go, okay. Uh, or, or they say it's a Linda's roadside skipper. And I say, how do you know it's a Linda's roadside skipper, which is an endangered species? And they go, well, because of the way that it is. I mean, that's, it's not helpful. Um, but you basically have to be an expert on them to tell them apart. Uh, you know, we, we talk about the silver spotted skipper specifically because it's so large and it's so easy to tell apart. When we're doing the training with our butterfly monitoring uh, volunteers, we only want them to be able to tell that one apart for the first year. And we add in a few other ones as time goes on. Um, things like the fiery skipper uh, is an example of another one or the sacum skipper uh, that are pretty frequently encountered, but they're just tricky to tell apart. Oftentimes the males and females look entirely different. And oftentimes one sex mimics a, a different skipper of a different species. And so you'll have three or four females that are different species that look almost um, aden uh, un uh, unidentifiable from each other that you have to like dissect them to tell them apart and things like that. So they're tricky. Um, a lot of the skippers that are small and orange and brown are grass skippers. They feed on different types of grasses as a caterpillar. And so there's lots of grasses out there. And so their numbers can just go crazy. Uh, when you, you, one way you can tell it's a skipper, some people think they're moths uh, because they're small. Uh, the skippers um, have um, this weird posture where the front wing is often tucked behind the rear wing so that the rear wings are actually, um, actually positioned equal to or in front of the um, front wings when they're at rest. And I always call that like the, the fighter, uh, fighter jet position where it looks like they're about to take off. Um, these are very common in flower gardens and places like that. Oftentimes I'll visit an area that'll have, you know, zinnias and echinaceas and things like that planted. And I'll estimate that there's a hundred of these in, in a couple square meters. They're just really, really populous. Uh, I see we got some, uh, maybe some, uh, Questions here in the chat. Um, anybody know what butterfly this is? Hopefully by now you know that these are question marks. So any questions? Um, let's see, I'm going to minimize this. Stop screen and let's see. I'm gonna check out the chat here. Um, so yeah, uh, minimum medium-sized butterfly, one or two inches. That's about right. Uh, so what kind of camera lens to get these amazing photos? Uh, a lot of it is just patience. I've taken some spectacular shots just with my iPhone. Um, when I'm, we send volunteers out to monitor, we always tell people that your iPhone can be one of the most useful um, reference tools that you can always snap a picture of a butterfly and it doesn't have to be perfect. And then you can you know, look it up in a book or something else after the fact. 
Um, is there a really good reference you can re recommend to begin learning these minute differences of the skippers? Well, yes and no. Um, it, they are tricky. Um, so there is a book that I do not have handy to show you, but it's called The Skipper Butterflies of Illinois, which um, is a very good reference. It's also a little outdated. And they are, to my knowledge, I don't think it's finished yet, but they're um, updating it and it's going to be a new edition that should be out. I think it was supposed to be out like last year, but you know, COVID and stuff happened. Um, the, let's see, let's do, is this still up? No, it's not going to let me do that. Let's see real quick. I'm going to switch over. I had one slide ready. There we go. Let's see if this works. There we go. So this is Butterflies of Illinois, uh, which is my favorite field guide that we that exists um, for Missouri butterflies. Um, yeah, it says of Illinois, and a lot of it is very uh, is a little unique to Illinois, and that it shows like which counties in Illinois you can expect to find it in. Um, there's also a book called Butterflies and Moths of Missouri, which I also have here. The Butterflies and Moths of Missouri is currently out of print, but you can still find copies in bookstores and on Amazon and things like that. The Butterflies of Illinois, though, is hands down my favorite field guide. Um, you open it up, there's something like 180 butterflies or something in the book. Um, you open it up and the front cover is a picture of every single butterfly that's in the book with its wings open. So you can see at a glance what you're looking for and kind of thumb through it and go right to it. And on the back cover when you open it up is a picture of all the same butterflies with their wings closed. So you can see at a glance and that is, I don't know why that doesn't exist in more field guides because it's such a cool thing um, that, you know, doesn't seem like that hard to implement for, for different things. Uh, but I love uh, the book for that reason. It's relatively inexpensive. It's produced by like the Illinois Department of Natural Resources or whatever their version of that, Illinois Natural History Survey. Um, they also produce the um, uh, Skipper Guide from, for Illinois. Uh, and it's actually the same author, James Weicker. Um, but I believe they're still working on the um, uh, skipper version, and I probably won't recommend buying the skipper version until the new edition comes out, you know, this year or next year, whenever it is. Well, that leads to another question then. Did they make a Moths of Illinois? They did, and um, they have at least the Silk Moths of Illinois, which I haven't tried Googling it before. We'll see if it pulls up, um, which is out of print, unfortunately. Yeah, and I don't want to catch. Uh, yeah, so it's this right here. And for the longest time, and it still may be if you go to the Illinois Natural History Survey or whatever, they have an online store where you can order this. You can buy this book brand new for like five bucks. And silk moths are not a huge group of moths. Uh, and it's just specific to them, but that's your Luna moths, your Cecropia moths, your Polythemus, Promethea, Io moths, and a couple others you're probably unfamiliar with, Rosy Maple Moth. Um, it's a really good book. And at five bucks, you can't really go wrong with it. It's just a somewhat limited um, topic because it's just the one family. Butterflies and Moths of Missouri um, is not a bad book in that it has lots of info on different moths and stuff, but there are so many moths and a lot of them are pretty hard to tell apart that a picture field guide isn't super helpful for. For like the big charismatic stuff, you're gonna find it in here, but it kind of only scratches the surface for certain things. And so it's, it's a tricky thing in general. Um, I'll show one other resource now that I'm thinking of it. Um, let me see real quick. Um, 
let's do this. I am stealing an image off of Google right now that, uh, all right, let's do this. I'm gonna save this. And I'm gonna show you, if you ever have a picture of a butterfly, how you can um, use a, a website to identify it. All right, we're gonna do this. Okay, so I'm gonna come back here. I'm gonna share my screen now that I've got my butterfly. Uh, any, anybody wanna guess what species this is right here? So if you go to the website Insects of Iowa, or we can just type in Insects of Iowa in Google. It's insectsofiowa.org. And they have this, it says need and identification. Click here to identify a butterfly from the United States. And my friend's dad actually runs this page. His daughter runs the insect uh, or the butterfly house at Iowa State University. And her dad is just a naturalist and likes computers and stuff. So he built this just for fun. So you type uh, your state in here. We are Missouri and we choose a file. And I saved that butterfly picture. Oops, where did it go? I saved that butterfly picture a moment ago. All right. And then we just tell it where the butterfly is and highlight that and then hit this button that says submit for identification. And it comes back and it tells us with 99.85% confidence that it is a viceroy butterfly, which is what it is. A tenth of 1%, it's a monarch, could also be a white admiral which is actually interesting when you see that that is the same genus. That's actually, and you can always, I think you can click on the butterfly and it will open up other pictures of it, which if you realize looks a lot like the red spotted purple because they actually have a different color morph called the white admiral. Uh, we just don't see it very often around here. So we just focus on the red spotted purple. So insects of Iowa, really cool. Uh, tool here to identify pretty much any um, type of butterfly. And it's actually really good at identifying skippers, um, which is both impressive and frustrating that this computer program can identify things better than me, but it absolutely can. If you've ever used the app iNaturalist, uh, it has something very similar where iNaturalist, you put in a, a picture and it can identify an insect with a high degree of success. Um, I like this one a little bit more for butterflies because it tells you with what level of precision it is. iNaturalist doesn't quite do that the same way. Um, this has been trained with all sorts of pictures that are bad. So you don't have to get a good picture of a butterfly. You can get one out of focus or at a weird angle or with only one wing showing or partially behind a blade of grass or a plant stem or whatever else. And oftentimes it still identifies it. It's, it's really, I think it's spectacular. Um, so um, that is about all I have. I am welcome to answer. If you have, everybody has any questions, you're welcome to ask them. I'm happy to uh, stick around if anybody has any other questions. Uh, I, I appreciate you all uh, st sticking around and learning about butterflies with me. Um, Thank you so much, Ted. This was really wonderful. Uh, always keep an eye out. You never know what you're going to find out there. Um, we had a few folks in the past sit through these talks, do some training just because they were curious about butterflies, which have turned into some really neat finds over the years. We've had people find queen butterflies in the area which queens are a cousin of the monarch, but they live down south. And there's been 
maybe half a dozen, maybe 10 sightings of queens in Missouri in the past couple decades. And um, like two of them were by people that went through a training just like this and, and learned about them. Uh, somebody took a picture and sent it to us of a white monarch. M most monarchs are black and orange, uh, but like one in a million are black and white. And they sent us that picture a couple of years ago and we looked through our records and it was the first confirmed black and white monarch that had been seen in Missouri in 108 years. So that was kind of cool. So there's neat things out there to find. Um, we see pictures of butterflies that are normally black and blue and yellow that are solid black, things like that happen out there. So um, there's cool things and you can find them in your backyard. The queen butterfly was in somebody's backyard. You know, just just hanging out at some milkweed. Um, so, uh, and if you ever come by the butterfly house, be sure to say hi. You know, we've got 1,500 butterflies in here that are all tropical, and I'd be happy to show you around and talk butterflies with you. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Dan. Uh, it's my pleasure. Um, I guess if there's no other questions, I'd say. Have a great day, everybody. And there's lots of butterflies to see outside on a sunny day. So you can go outside and tell me what you find. Well, actually, I, I just remember I have one last question. Sure. Um, out, out here at Litzinger, we see the eastern tailed blues on things like carcasses and scat a lot. Yeah. Um, are they getting minerals or what are they looking for? Yeah. So one of the dark side of butterflies is that they will go to lots of different things for food. They'll go to carcasses. Uh, especially the little um, Lysenids, little blue blues like to go to poo and dead animals and they're getting trace nutrients there. You know, nectar is, you know, it's basically Kool-Aid and, you know, it's great for a burst of energy when you need it, but there's not a lot of trace nutrients in there. Um, so butterflies can get certain salts, certain minerals, amino acids as well. Um, if you, if you want to catch a butterfly in the woods, the grosser, weirder thing you can put on the ground is going to attract them more than like sugar water, you know, um, you know, poo or urine or alcohol. You pour a beer on the ground, especially in more tropical environments where there's a lot of butterflies that feed on fermented fruits and things like that. All of that's going to attract butterflies. Desert butterflies go to urine for the salts and stuff like crazy. Um, you know, so in the butterfly house, you always have butterflies that land on people and they say, oh, you must be sweet. And you think, well, yeah, in the wild days, guys eat dead animals. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, so you'll see them, especially um, some of the blues and stuff really go for um, poo or carry on. Um, you'll also see some of the larger butterflies, um, swallowtails will um, puddle where they get um, salts mostly, and it's usually males that are getting salts from places like um, muddy riverbanks and things like that, or drying out salt puddles. And you'll sometimes come across like a group of a hundred butterflies around a single mud puddle in the forest. Yeah, out at Shaw Nature Reserve, they would gather on some of the hilltop gravel roads out there and just be in huge numbers. And uh, yeah. the persimmon groves that they had out there were big attractors because of all the persimmons that dropped underneath. There's um, an area here in the park that where the um, the workers drive their heavy machinery has caused ruts in the road that gather mud puddles, and it's right next to a bunch of hackberry trees. And so there's always um, hackberry emperors around it that are puddling. And as soon as those puddles dry out, they go crazy for people because they're sort of used to being in that area to get their salts. And that's when they just start bombarding people to get their, um, you know, their sweat from their bodies. Right. Well, we'll let you go. Thank you so much. This is, um, it's a lot of fun. Thanks everybody. I appreciate you having me. And if you come to the butterfly house, be sure to say hi. See you, everybody. Bye -bye. Take care.